Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today we'll be interpreting Matthew 6, 5, chapter 6, verse 5. This is part of our interpretation of the Lord's Prayer and the surrounding commands in Matthew's chapter 6, verses 5 to 13. For those of you who missed the lecture and discussion last week on Zoom, this will help you as you prepare for your homework for tomorrow. I just wanted to give several brief introductory comments before we go into the text. The first comment is just what you will need in working through it. You'll need a uh, pen, pencil, colored pens, and highlighters. If you cannot get a hold of highlighters of different colors or colored pens, as we work through this, as we work through this process, we have different uh, shapes that will be able to really keep things separate. So you don't have to have different colored pens or highlighters, although that's recommended. You also need a Bible. You'll need access to Step Bible program online. And if you can't, if you don't, you can either download it or you can access it at a different time. And then also you need the grammatical relationships key. Just a quick overview of our discussion. We will be identifying key parts of the sentence. Then we'll also be asking important questions connected to those key parts. Uh, we will also offer a guide to research answers. We'll highlight key theological truths that the passage is teaching. And so we won't go into everything, but we'll give you uh, some highlights and also some things that you can further study on your own. We'll also introduce steps and direction towards building an outline to teach. Lastly, the uses of this video. This is part of the series on interpreting the Lord's Prayer. So this will be verses 5, and then this will be part of verses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. This can be used on cl in classes or discussions concerning prayer, the spiritual disciplines, introduction to biblical interpretation, and also book studies in the gospel according to Matthew. So you can use this specific interpretation guide in these different classes. Let's go ahead now to the text itself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read. I'm just going to read the passage so you can see that there. What I'll do is I'll read the passage and then it will work on verses 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our focus for today is just going to be on verses 5. Verses 5, so we're going to zoom in onto the first clause. If you notice here, I've broken this out by independent clauses or sentences. I've done this using capitalization and periods and punctuation. So as you work in any passage of scripture, you'd want to look at that. And, and that's a good guide to separating out the passage to explore it. So I'm just going to delete these really quick here. Okay, here we go. Let's go ahead and look here. The first thing I want to do is I want to identify verbs. So as I'm breaking this down, I want to first look for verb. I see two verbs here. Pray, and also you shall not be like, or shall not be, shall not be. Those are the verbs. And I'm going to identify what type of verbs are these. So from this point, I'm going to take a pause, and I'm going to look at my grammatical relationships. I'm going to focus in on this verb section here, and I'm going to pick the type of verb that best describes the verb in this context. So here I see the pray fits the best option of action, the process of accomplishing something, typically the accomplishment of a task or aim. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to label this action. The next verb is shall not be. 
shall not be. So let's go back to our verb options. Looking down here, I see this verb state. The definition is, it is a verb that describes the state of being of, of the subject. And so this could be an option for us. However, not a reality for us, if you think logically, meaning to say that actor or the subject has not actually been like that. And, and it seems to be a call to action. So to me, it, it doesn't seem to be simply a state, although that is part of it. it. And it's not a command because a command is an imperative verb telling to, to do something. I think the best option would be a prohibition, the imperatival verb telling someone to refrain from an action. So it's calling us to not be like something. And so I'm going to choose a prohibition here. I'm going to choose a prohibition here. So it's calling us to not be like something. The next step I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the actors. Now I want to also identify who the you is, who the you is. And at first we're tempted to immediately say it's us, it's the reader. But when we look at the Gospel of Matthew, although we are the final recipients, there is a audience in the original context. So let's go first to Step Bible. I brought up Step Bible here. I am going to type in a search. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 5, search. And looking here, chapter 6 is within the context of the Sermon on the Mount. And so we want to identify who the audience is, who the people originally are speaking to. This isn't to say that we're removing the, the command to us, but we first need to identify the original, uh, the original audience. And then from there, um, we can make application to us. And so I see here in verses 1 of chapter 5, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. And so the original context, the first audience is the 12 disciples. Okay, next we have this clause over here, like the hypocrites, like the hypocrites. So we see a, a connecting word here and this phrase. And so this phrase is, is being connected with the subject through this, through this verb. And what is the relationship here? Well, it's, it's describing in some way what we're not supposed to be. And so if I come back to our handout, I'm going to come down and look at adverbial relationships describing the verb. If I look down here, I'm going to look first at keywords. If I come down here, I see keywords like. That's the keyword that I highlighted, the connecting word. And that fits within the, the option of comparison. The definition is the relationship describes an analogy with the main verb or action. That seems to fit pretty well with the like, what you should not be like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to identify this as a comparison. We have this, this word here that we really want to investigate. Who are the hypocrites? So I want to investigate this word. This is a word I want to investigate. So thinking about how important this word is, I'm going to go ahead and just make several quick questions about it because we want to, we want to investigate this. Questions that we can ask. So we have several questions that we can ask here. Number one, what is its definition? So we are just going to look up in a lexicon or a dictionary what the definition of this word hypocrite. Next, we're going to look at who are the hypocrites in, the context, in this immediate context and also in the broader context of the Gospel of Matthew. And also we want to look at how does Jesus or the Gospel of Matthew define this word hypocrite. So we're going to come back here and as, and as we really unpack this. We're going to try to get more information here. So I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Let's finish this sentence really quick here and then move on before we move on to, to further questions about the hypocrites. Because we want to see if the, we always want to look first at the context to see if the context defines it. And then we look outside. So it's, it's slowly broadening our search, but we want to look in the context first. So let's go ahead and finish this sentence first. So we have, an, we have one other adverbial clause here. I'm just going to separate it out. This is going to be a, a time clause, and the clue is the use of the word when. And again, this is describing when we should not be, 
When should we not be like the hypocrites? Specifically, when we pray. And then lastly, we have this we have this connecting word here, and, and it's showing some type of connection with the previous context, which we can explore later. And so just off the bat, I can make some type of um, observations here. It's either going to be a series connection, a progression connection from the previous context, but there's going to be some type of connection here, okay? We're not 100% sure yet. We can investigate that later, but our focus is really moving forward. Okay, let's look now at the next clause. I'm going to immediately look at this connecting word here because there's some type of relationship here, okay? And that's really going to give us the relationship between the two sentences here. And if I look at this, I can come down here at this looking for the word for. So I'm going to come over and look for the word for. And I see the word for in this category here for keywords. And if I come over here, it's an explanatory conjunction or connecting word. These connecting words or conjunctions introduce clauses that explain the previous sentence in some way. And so this here is going to explain this is going to give us an explanation in some way, this, this command. So this, what is to follow, explains the previous command, okay? Now let's go ahead and identify verbs. You have one verb there, love to pray. And if we're coming over here, we also see a, a verb over here, may be seen. And just knowing what I already know, this is going to be an action, it's clear. An action, this is also going to be an action. Who is the, the actors? I have one actor here. We're going to identify the pronoun, and that is, of course, the actor is hypocrite. So, you shall not be like the hypocrites for they. Clearly, the antecedent is hypocrite. So I'm just going to put here, hypocrite. So now we know that hypocrite is being defined. Hypocrite is being defined for us by Jesus and ultimately, ultimately by Matthew. So now we have two other clauses here. We have this connecting word. And we can go further in we can go further and further into all these relationships, but I'm just focusing on the big relationships. So I'm not going to go into to all the different grammatical relationships here, but what we can say here is at least there's a location one. Standing in the synagogues describes an action and a location. We're just going to focus on this qualifying of the, of the action. Location one, standing in the synagogues. Location two, on the street corners. And of course, these are... These are connecting and qualifying the action. Where do the hypocrites love to pray? They love to pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. So at this point, we can actually make a pretty, we know the context of who does this. We know the context, the gospels, especially those of us that are familiar with the gospels. It's appropriate for us to at least make a conclusion saying that the hypocrites are most probably Pharisees because that's what they do, um, obviously. But let's but, the, but let's go further than that. Let's 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 really define this more precisely. So let's first look at this definition, okay? Let's first look at this definition. Let's define, let's go deeper here, okay? So we're going to go back to step bible. So I'm going back to the contents of Matthew 6, 5. And so let's just look up this word first. We can, Step Bible allows us to look up the word. I'm going to click on it again. A hypocrite comes from the literal Greek word hypocrites. Hypocrites. So literally it's a transliteration of the Greek word hypocrite. That's how we would say it in English. And the definition here is it, it is an actor of a play implying arrogance, hardness of heart, devoid of sincerity or genuineness. And so it's a counterfeit. So it's, it's, it seems to be a very clear definition and a very sobering definition. We can say here several, several ways to define it. It's an actor. 
An actor or a pretender has hard heart, hard hearts. And also, we can say that it, um, they focus on external action. External action disagrees with internal motives. So that's how we can define it. So this is very important for us, especially if we're called not to be like this. Now let's go back to Step Bible and let's do a word search. I want to search this word. So I'm going to X out of here. And I'm just going to, I'm going to limit the search to Matthew. And I'm going to look up this word hypocrite. Now I just type in the word hypocrite and you see several options that come to mind. I don't want to choose the English option because it's going to limit my search. I want to choose all the searches with this um, Greek option. So if you can see the Greek word on the right, I'm going to go ahead and click that and we're going to search this. Ah, so we get a whole bunch of examples here. We have a whole bunch of examples here. So let's just look at contexts surrounding hypocrites. Thus, uh, Matthew 6, 2, the previous context, and we have this this and connection. So, so there's a close connection with the previous context. Matthew 6, 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may be praised by others. So that's almost the identical description for us. The only difference is that of giving to the needy versus praying. So there's a similar action that's occurred in verse 6, uh, verse 2. Verse 5 is our context. Verse 16, when you fast, do not be gloomy like the hypocrites. So again, it's a very similar context to our, to our verse, just a different spiritual pr practice. 7.5, do not, you hypocrite, first take out the log out of your own eye that you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So again, th there's a reference to a lack of awareness to your own internal condition and you're attacking someone else. And so that's the definition of a hypocrite, someone who, who is focusing on someone's issues and not understanding their own. Now we have Matthew 15, 7, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, so I really want to investigate that. Jesus and Matthew are really focusing in on defining hypocrite for us. So I'm going to use another, another step. By, I've already prepared it here. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. So let me just, before we read here, I want to just briefly add these. So I've done a word search here. Let's look at Matthew 15, 1 to 8, and see who are the hypocrites. What is their practices? How are they defined? And what is their reality of them? Let's look here. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So that's the definition of a hypocrite. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And when he called the people to him and he said to them, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And so we have several very important things to identify here concerning these hypocrites. So from this word search, so we can make several important identifications about what a hypocrite is, who is the hypocrite, how can we define what hypocrisy is. So let's just take a moment and write down some
some key facts or truths from Matthew 15, 1 to 16. Number one, the scribes and Pharisees are the hypocrites. Number one, the scribes and Pharisees are the hypocrites. Number two, number two, they have their own rules. Number three, Number three, these rules often violate the rules of God. Number four, the rules have truths which are mixed with errors or error. Number five, number five, the outward appears to be good, but the inward is corrupt. And number six, Number six, their heart is evil. They are blind and will be uprooted by God. So this is very significant. What we have here, when which needs to be discussed more, is external religion, internal heart change. Or we talked about this. Professing faith versus saving faith. And there's many places in the scripture that you can, that you can go uh, further and explore. At this point, we just want to give you some direction as far as further defining what a hypocrite is and really why it's so important that we need to understand the, tr the true concept of hypocrisy and how we must have no, we we should have no part of it. There's also uh, Matthew chapter 23 that you can explore as well. Okay, I'll leave I'll leave that for right now. Very significant. Let's finish this. Let's finish this verse now. We're getting near the end. Let's look at this last phrase. Now that we've really identified hypoc the hypocrites hypocrisy. Let's look now and let's finish this clause here. Let's go in this last clause that's dependent. I first want to identify the verb, may be seen. The verb is may be seen, which is of course an action. And then we want to identify the actor. Now we would be at first tempted to identify the subject as the actor, which is this. But we notice that the subject is not the one doing the action. The subject is not actually doing the one that is seeing, but being seen. So this would be incorrect to identify this as the actor. In reality, the actor is in this prepositional phrase, and it's men. The actor is the prepositional phrase, and it's men. And then the object, that which is receiving, is actually the they. And of course, the they is as we identified earlier. This is hypocrites. The connection is with this connecting word that. This is a clause. And we can clearly see that this too is connected with describing this main action of love to pray. Now, what is the precise relationship? The precise relationship for that, if we go to our handout, Let's look at our handout here, and we go to adverbial relationships. And if I look over here for this word that, it could be a result, or we have that up here. It could be a purpose. The use indicates the goal or aim of an action. What is the goal or aim of this loving to pray? The goal or the aim of loving to pray is this, that they may be seen of men. So this is the purpose here. This is the purpose for the action. So hypocrites love to pray, why or to what purpose? It's so that they could be seen of men. Let us quickly restate this. What is a simple paraphrase of this, that they may be seen of men? If, we were, if you recall from the word search in Matthew 6, 2, we had a, a parallel context. They used the phrase, Praise of men. And that's really what the purpose is. The purpose of what hypocrites pray in, in 
the synagogues and the stream quarters is for the praise of men. Now, I want to ask an applicational, before we end, I want to ask this applicational question. So we want to make an we want to ask the applicational question what are the synagogues and street corners of our day? So someone who's a legalist or someone who is trying to 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 fulfill this command in a literal sense and not in the spirit of the command would say okay as long as I am not loving to pray in synagogues literally synagogues or street corners then I'm fulfilling this this warning of not being hypocritical. But that's to not understand our day. My question for us is what are the synagogues of Takloban? What are the synagogues in the U.S.? What are the street corners of ta in Takloban? So we have, two, we have two ideas here. Synagogue or two places. Synagogue and we have street corner. Let's paraphrase this or word this in our own words. The synagogue was the common place of worship for Jews in the first century. So let's change this to public public place of worship. This could be public testimony of faith. So these are two different places. In one place it's where we're worshiping publicly together, place of worship. In the other sense the street corner is where you can publicly testify to your faith, okay? Now, we did this in class, and if we were just to look at this objectively, we would have to say this would have to be the church. And this would, ha this would most likely be social media or any public gathering. When we, when we identify it like this, this is very sober. Because how, how many times have we done something? How many times have we prayed? How many times have we done something, engaged in something, given something, spent our time? And in the back of our minds, we are thinking about, oh, my pastor is going to think highly of me. Um, I'm going to do this because of what my father-in-law will think. Or I'm going to do this to impress so-and-so. And we do that a lot in social media. We're all guilty. Anyone who points a finger has four or three fingers and a thumb pointing back at them. But this is really convicting to all of us because Jesus is calling us to do something very important. He's calling us to pray to God or to communicate with our Heavenly Father. And in doing this, he's warning us that when we, when we pray, when we engage in this activity, we have to have absolute and complete purity in our heart. And we cannot be doing this for the praise of men. Now, why? Why must we be not doing this for the praise of men? There are many, there are different reasons. It's interesting that Jesus gives this specific reason. He doesn't say you will be judged, which if you read through all the Gospel of Matthew, we actually find out the hypocrites are judged. But what he does is he does give us this last statement here, which is very sobering. So let's just work through it really quick. There are two verbs. Say, which is a statement. It's a... Uh, a statement in that it's going to give the content of something. The object or the person to which it's said is, of course, the you, or this would be 12 disciples or disciples generally. Maybe it's more than the 12 disciples. The actor is I or Jesus. And then this is the content. The content is they have their reward. The action is half. If we were to look up that word in Step Bible, which we don't have time to do, some translations have have received. So this is a action. And there's two more objects here. Someone is receiving, and then they're receiving an object, which is the reward. And of course, then the question is, what is the reward? And the reward is defined from back here. The reward is the praise of men. That's it. 
That's what's given. That is what is given. That's it. So this is very sobering. Let's look up. Let's quickly look up this assured this assuredly statement here. Truly. So step Bible has truly. It literally is amen, Greek amen, and it's a solemn expression of certainty, describing the action. And this is a em em emphasis that what is to follow is the truth. And so the warning here is that if we pray to be seen and praised of men, that is all you get. There's no other reward. No matter how much you pray, no, no matter how eloquent your prayer is, no matter how amazing your prayer is, that is it. So in conclusion here of this passage, let's go ahead and make some just let's talk about relationships. If we were comparing this here, this is almost like a conclusion. But if we were to make make an outline here, I would see, I would have the main point as a warning to not pray with impure motives. Something along the, those lines. And you could have A, don't, do not. Number A, don't pray like the hypocrites. B, description. You could say description or explanation, which is praying for praise of men, and then C could be, C could be this warning that there's no future reward from God. So there's different ways that you could, you could word this. If you're going to have a larger, if you're going to have a larger sermon, you can even break this down further and just have this as the first main point. Don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray hypocritical. I would definitely include in working through this talking about about internal versus external worship. I would also bring out the application of what it means, and then I'd also bring out the reward, the warning of no reward. Okay. The big takeaway here, though, for structure is this is the main point, and then these are subpoints. Okay. So this is the main point. This is the main idea, and then these are supporting points. And there, it's not a one-to-one. -one. So in one example, you have an explanation, in one you have a command, and one you have a conclusion, and that's fine. Your goal in writing an outline to teach is not to have symmetry, is not to have an amazing outline, profound truths. Your goal is to make observations, exposit or explain the text, and then to make real life application in the life of the believer and the church. Anyway, I hope that this was a help for you. I hope that this made sense. And we're going to continue on with verses 6 um, and then 7, 8, 9 and, and the, the, the rest of the Lord's Prayer. I hope that this will be a guide as you prepare. And you could just preach this one verse. There's so much truth in here. You could teach this one verse. And I hope that this is a help for you. God bless and we'll see you on the next one.